Chapter 25, Ireland, Plan B. In that last week of July, when Russia was mobilizing her armies on the German border, war became certain. The secret elite had known for at least a decade that when Germany reacted to the Russian mobilization, she would have little option but to simultaneously advance on France through Belgium. They were confident that the German breach of Belgium's neutrality Belgium's neutrality would provide their council belly. But what if par Parliament overwhelmingly rejected entering the war on the pretext of defending Belgium? What if Germany did the unexpected and poured her armies directly over the French borders further south, south through Alsace and Lorraine? Secret elite had a, full, a fallback position a plan B they always had. Astonishing as it sounds, that fallback position was to be civil war in Ireland. You will find no evidence of this in history books. It isn't there. But look hard at the extraordinary evidence presented in the following pages and decide for yourself. We will demonstrate how the secret elite willfully promoted strife between the mainly Protestant Unionist North and the largely Catholic Nationalist South and had their agents armed both opposing and had their agents on both opposing camps with weapons purchased in Germany. If for whatever reason their justification for taking Britain to war could not be found in a German violation of Belgium, civil war in Ireland would immediately have been ignited. Banner headlines in the pro war British press would have immediately blamed Germany the Kaiser would have stood accused of arming both sides in a devious attempt to neutralize Britain through internal conflict. Outrage on the streets would most certainly have followed, with public insistence that the country immediately join France and Russia against the evil Hun. A similar plan had been considered when Alfred Milner in the run-up to the Boer War okay, a similar plan had been considered when Alfred Milner was in the run-up to the Boer War. His Balliol college friend and member of the inner core of the secret elite, Philip Littleton Joe, who Milner made a director of the British South Africa country, wrote to him in July of 1899, insisting that more direct action be taken to stir war. <coughs> Gell described the British public as the uninstructed mass of limp opinion and added that something more has got to happen before the government could prudently take the initiative in bloodshed. A fresh murder would start the people. People would like that if the murder was really brutal. Though he was talking about the Transvaal in 1899, the same remarks applied to the Sarajevo in 1914. Same remarks applied to Sarajevo in 1914. Of even greater interest was a fallback position to which Joe made direct reference, the importance of guns and ammunition to South Africa. His view was as, was that his view was that if the British public realized that the Boers had imported arms from Germany to be used against British subjects, the cause for war would be popular and obvious and Kruger had taken such a step. In the aftermath of the Jameson raid, the Boers imported 37,000 Mossers from Krupp's factory in Germany. The ploy was identical, both in 1899 and 1914. The secret elite had a considered fallback plan involving guns and ammunition provided by Germany that would have turned public opinion in favor of war. Civil war in Ireland was never the intention, but the appearance of one had to be real, and the secret elite wielded the power to take matters as far as they deemed necessary. Churchill was later to admit that German agents reported and German statesmen believed that England was paralyzed by faction and drifting into civil war. The carefully engineered crisis in Ireland presented coincidental bonuses. A large, a large paramilitary force in the north, the Ulster Volunteer Force, 
March drilled and trained with rifles for months before the outbreak of war under the instruction of former senior British Army officers. After the outbreak of war, a considerable number of these men enlisted with the 36th Ulster Division of the British Army. Perhaps of greater importance was that, with public attention focused on Ireland, the secret elite created a very convenient smokescreen behind which they prepared for action on the continent. When the 5th Battalion, the Black Watch, was ordered to muster on the 31st of July, the soldiers assumed they were headed for Ireland only to be thoroughly disappointed that their allotted task was to protect the Tay Bridge from an imaginary invasion force. We thought we were going to Ulster when we got orders last night. There would have been some excitement there. Plenty of excitement lay ahead but not in Dundee or Belfast. While historians and commentators wrongly use the concept of inevitability in conjunction with the First World War in July of 1914, the only war that seemed inevitable then to the people of Britain was war in Ireland. The secret elite was not responsible for century-old religious animosities in Ireland, but they manipulated them to their own ends. Ireland was riven by religious antagonisms between the historic Protestant ascendancy in the, in the industrial north and an agricultural Catholic majority in the south. The country was divided between those who wished Ireland greater degrees of self-government and the pro-empire loyalist Protestants who had themselves to be British first, foremost, and forever who held themselves to be British first, foremost, and forever. The 1914 crisis was generated in the first instance by the introduction of a home rule, a home rule, home rule bill for Ireland. The two previous home rule bills had been thrown out of Westminster. The first in 1886 was outvoted in the Commons and the second in 1893 was rejected by the House of Lords. After the general election of 1910, the political arithmetic in Westminster radically changed. With the hung parliament and the liberals dependent on the support of Irish home rule, MPs to cling to power. Let's read that again. After the general election of 1910, the political arithmetic in Westminster radically changed. With the hung parliament and the liberals dependent on the support of Irish Home Rule's MPs to cling to power, the quid pro quo was yet another Home Rule, home rule Bill to establish a parliament in Dublin. Control of the Treasury, taxation, the armed forces, and most importantly foreign policy would however remain firmly at Westminster. Ulstermen feared above all a role reversal where Protestants would become second-class citizens instead of a Catholic, inside of a Catholic state. Had it not suited their purpose, the secret elite could have brought down Asquith's government and replaced it. But the formation of a liberal conservative coalition was put to one side, mistakenly believing they were an integral part of a great democracy. Backbench MPs from opposing sides waved their order papers at one another and bayed across the House of Commons with jeers and insults while their leaders while their leaders met cordially behind the scenes, briefed each other and ensured that what was happening in Ireland was under their control. It mattered little to the secret elite which of their teams was running the government. Just as long as the path to war was being followed diligently in pursuing the House Home, the Home Rule Bill, with all their might, the Liberal team of Asquith, Gray, and Churchill, and Lloyd George was doing just that. The secret elite fanned the fear, tension, and hatred, and religious bigotry on both sides. Churchill and Lloyd George deliberately antagonized the Yoltsermen while Bonar Law and his team professed loyalty to, loyalty to them. The entire charade was carefully staged and managed, stage managed. Though he had no experience of leadership, Edward Carson, a lawyer and unionist MP for Trinity College, neither an Alsterman nor an or 
nor an orange man, but a Dublin MP was chosen by the secret elite to stir Protestant Ulster. He championed their heritage, their genuine and deeply held commitments to the Protestant cause and raised the battle frenzy against home rule. Carson was a creation of the secret elite. He owned his he owed his political fortune to Arthur Arthur Balfour of the Inner Circle. As Secretary for Ireland in earlier years, Balfour had appointed him as Chief Prosecuting Attorney, arranged a safe parliamentary seat, and elevated him to the post of Solicitor General in his 1903 government. Balfour was proud to boast that he had made Carson. Carson's second-in-command in Ulster, James Craig, was a millionaire Belfast whiskey distiller who served as an officer of the Imperial Yeomantry in South Africa, where his capture and release by the Boers was in stark contrast to the treatment melted out, meted out in the British concentration camps. Like most of the secret elite placement in Ulster, Craig's involvement in the Boer War under Lord Roberts gave him the stamp of an empire loyalist who they could trust. He rejoined in Ulster's place in the in the empire. He was Unionist MP for East Down and Grand Master of the Orange Lodge of County Down. James Craig had an organization, had an organizational and administrative flair that served Ulster well, and he formed a very effective partnership with Edward Carson. Once the Home Rule Bill had been introduced to Parliament in April of 1912. The Ulster Unionist Council was urged to stand firmly against it. The council appointed a commission to take immediate steps in consultation with Edward Sir Carson, Sir Edward Carson, to frame and submit a constitution for a provisional government in Ulster. Carson, in turn, pr promised the Protestants that, with the help of God, you and I, joined together, will yet defeat the most nefarious conspiracy that has ever been hashed against a free people. There was indeed a nefarious conspiracy, but it extended far beyond the four provinces of Ireland. Carson's commission was to keep a firm hand on Ulster, maintain its integrity, and lead its Protestant lodges and unionist clubs. He had to fan the flames while preserving the narrow margin between dissent and rebellion. Powerful politicians made public their support for Ulster. Bonar Law, Balfour's successor as leader of the Conservative Party was both a friend and admirer of Sir Edward Carson. He waded into the murky Irish waters on Easter Tuesday, 1912, at an enormous demonstration, well in excess of 100,000 strong, at the Balmoral Showground near Belfast. Seventy special trains ferried Unionists and Orangemen from all parts of the province, opening prayers from the primate of all Ireland and the moderator of the Presbyterian Church marked the solemnity of the occasion, where symbolically a Unionist party, the Unionist Party of Great Britain, met and grasped the hand of Ulster loyalism. Bonar Law brought 70 members of the British Parliament with him, including Lord Hugh Cecil, Walter Long, Ian Malcolm, and Leo Mary all intimately connected with the secret elite. Bonar, Bonar Law, son of the Canadian Orangeman and himself an Ulster Scot, invoked the memory of the siege of Derry, rousing the crowd with a passionate speech that ended, You have saved yourself by the exertions, and you will save the empire by your example. Rudy Kipling, Another member of the secret elite was equally unstinting in his loyalty. His poem, Ulster 1912, first published in the Morning Post of April 9, 1912, expressed fear and loathing as seen through the eyes of an Ulster abandoned by England, where we know the bells prepared by those who serve, not Rome. Every prejudice was dressed in the Union flag. The passion of ordinary working-class Irish Protestants was whipped into a lather by fear that they were about to be surrendered as hostage to Catholic Dublin. But they did not start a civil war. No one broke rank. 
Carson and his allies in the lodges and clubs of Ulster maintained a remarkable and imp impressive discipline in the province. Demonstration of lo demonstrations of loyalty and solidarity continued with the public declaration of formal defiance. On the 28th of September, 1912, Sir Edward Carson was first to sign Ulster's Solemn League and Covenant, stage managed in perfection stage managed to perfection carson demonstrated his wonderful sense of occasion by walking the hundred yards from ulster hall to city hall escorted by guards from the orange lodges and unionist clubs of belfast with the boyne with the boyne standards born before him Altogether, almost half a million people pledged their opposition to home rule by signing a covenant, or in the case of women, the declaration. They promised to stand by one another in defending our cherished position of equal citizenship in the United Kingdom and in using all means to defeat the present conspiracy to set up a home rule parliament in Dublin. Thousands more who could prove their Ulster origins signed in Ireland England and Scotland, it was all carefully choreographed. At West Westminster in January of 1913, Carson tried to use parliamentary procedures to exclude the whole province of Ulster from the Home Rule Bill, but his amendment was defeated. Consequently, preparations for a breakaway provisional government and all that it involved in Ulster were stepped up dramatically. On the 13th of January, 1913, an illegal private army, the Ulster Volunteer Force, was formally established. Recruitment was limited to 100,000 men, aged from 17 to 65, who had signed the covenant, the Pure Blood Loyalist. On the advice of Lord Roberts, Carson ap appointed the retired Lieutenant General Sir George Richardson to lead the Ulster Volunteers. Richardson was in residence in Belfast within the month, and a series of parades were organized to introduce him to the volunteers. Sir Edward Carson boldly, boldly stated that the UVF was no longer a collection of unrelated units, but the general's leadership and army at Antrium of the 21st of September. At Atrium on the 21st of September, he warned, we have pledges and promises from some of the greatest generals in the British Army who have given their word that when the time comes, they will come over and help us to keep the old flag flying. It was no empty boast. Lord Roberts Academy would see to that. The Ulster Loyalists had other powerful and determined friends inside the secret elite, including Milner, Corzon, Balfour, Walter Long, and Leo O'Meary, in addition to the entire Conservative Party, leading newspapers and influential industrialists. Like Carson, each played clearly defined roles in stirring the Ulster men to a frenzy of fear and resistance against Asquith's government, an enemy that would not listen to their pleas. Few outside the inner sanctum of the secret elite appreciated exactly how much control was vested in Alfred Milner who emerged from the back rooms of manipulative politics to play a pivotal role. No one was more influential, more determined, and more willing to take action than Milner. He wrote a very confidential private letter to Carson on the 9th of December, 1913, in which he pledged his total commitment to Ulster and offered his services as one who disbelieved the mere talk. Offered his services as one who disbelieved in mere talk. Connected as he was to all the organs of power, Milner knew precisely what the government intended and reassured Carson, and reassured Carson that they were just passing the time. The entire construct was a charade. No one in London intended to subvert the people of Ulster, but the possibility of an impending civil war had to be given substance to prepare for Plan B. Milner assured Carson that he would paralyze the arm which might be raised to strike you. In other words, 
there were huge risks involved in unleashing dark forces throughout Ireland. But Milner reassured Carson that the British army would not be used against Ulsterman. Carson had to control the UF, the UVF, and Milner had to control the army response. <clears throat> Read between the lines of this illuminating letter, and you'll understand the nature of the audacious plan. Milner and the secret elite knew that the government would not subvert Ulster no matter how it might seem. Most importantly, Milner promised to paralyze any move by the army against the UVF. This was the secret elite's covenant with Ulster. We will guarantee your safety and integrity and nullify the government's military authority in Ireland. But the charade had to continue, and it did. Words brought encouragement, but it was deeds that mattered. Milner's promise to Carson was backed by a vast secret elite fund. Wardroff Astor, the immigre American millionaire and the member of the secret elite's inner corps, donated 30,000 pounds. His astonishing benevolence equated to 2.25 million pounds in current money. Rudyard Kipling gave a similar donation. Lord Rothschild contributed 10,000 pounds, as did the wealthy Luke, Duke of Belford, and Lord Vea, the multi-millionaire head of the Guinness family. Intriguingly, one contributor, C, was not identified, even in a very secret document, leaving fair speculation as to whom that might have been. The secret elite amassed over 100,000 pounds, approximately 8 billion 8 million pounds today for Carson's work in Ulster and its spending provoked great alarm. Milner was Milner also wanted to use parliamentary process to blunt the British military in Ireland, but no politician would follow that ploy. General Sir Henry Wilson, senior member of the Roberts Academy, was at that point director of military operations at the war office and advisor to the government and the committee of imperial defense this was the same sir henry who had repeatedly reconnoitred belgium for the secret elite briefed ask with gray lloyd george and churchill during the agadir incident who was responsible for the british expeditionary force and knew the precise details of the plans for war with germany like Lord Roberts, Henry Wilson was full of admiration for his friends in the UVF. From January 1914, though the British Army saw very little of him, he regularly slipped over to Ulster to hold secret meetings with the Unionist leaders and observe at close hand the UVF's forces as they exercised. Incredibly, the Director of Military Operations at the War Office in London was in cahoots with the very people in Ulster with whom his own troops might be in imminent conflict, and had he, and he had access to their plans and organizations. Colonel Hackett Payne, a Boer War veteran under Lord Roberts' command, currently UVF Chief of Staff, issued a secret program on the February 7th of 1914 for full mobilization of the UVF. And undated unsigned memorandum headed the coup recommended a sudden complete and paralyzing blow all rail links telegraph telephone and cable lines were to be severed all roads into ulster closed and all british army depots of arms ammunition and military equipment seized along with supply depots for british troops and the police Weapons were only to be used if fired upon, but any attempt to arrest UVF commanders was to be forcibly resisted. It was a plan. Armies have, ha have to have plans, and it leaked. In March of 1914, Ulster almost exploded, or so it appeared. The Unionists claimed that the Liberals, including Churchill and Lloyd George, had concocted a spurious accusation that a plot had been hatched in Ulster to grab control of arms and ammunition in army stores. Churchill was deliberately provocative in a speech on March 14th at Bradford, 
where he warned of bloodshed in Ulster and threatened to put these grave matters to the proof. He ordered a squadron of battleships, cruisers, and destroyers from the coast of Spain to Lamlash on the Isle of Aran, menacingly close to Belfast. Both political factions of the secret elite in London were vigorously and successfully stirring the Irish cauldron. At the same time, John Seeley, Secretary for War, drafted an instruction to Sir Arthur pa Paget, the Commander-in-Chief of the British Army in Ireland, to take special and urgent precautions to ensure that the stores of Armagh, Carrick Fergus, Homage and Ekin and Anikilin and Nisklin were properly guarded. Puget was yet another officer who had served and been promoted under Lord Robert's command in the Boer War. Rumors were spread that the British government intended to arrest the leaders of the Ulster Unionist Council and the Times warned sternly that any man of government that increases the danger by blundering or hasty action will accept a terrible responsibility. All that followed has generally been brushed aside by historians as confusion and misunderstanding, muddled by exasperated cabinet ministers and political opportunists. Not so, what followed was proof of the absolute authority of the secret elite over the British military establishment and its key officers. Milner had promised that he would paralyze the arm raised against Ulster, and he did. He had invited General Wilson to the exclusive seclusion of Brooks Club as early as November of 1913 to ensure he knew that the secret elite would look after its own. They were effectively plotting treason. Milner assured him that if any army officer resigned rather than order their troops against the UVF, the incoming conservative administration would ensure that they were fully reinstated. Mil Wilson duly informed colleagues so that it reached the ears of serving officers everywhere precisely as intended. There was a similar move from Sir Edward Carson, who asked Milner to guarantee a fund for officers who decided to resign rather than violate their conscience the seeds of rebellion took root. When Puget was ordered to reinforce strategic points in Ulster against evil disposed persons who allegedly intended to raid British Army stores, he did not consider the action justified. Consequently, Puget was summoned to London on the 18th and 19th of March where he received direct instructions from a subcommittee at the War Office that included Sir John French, another senior member of the Roberts Academy. Immediately after the meeting, French discussed its conclusions with General Wilson, who on the same night dined with Milner and Carson, the men dedicated to protect Ulster against any move by the British Army. Why? Was Wilson informing them of the War, war Office decisions that had been leaked by him, that had been leaked to him by Sir John French? or taking instruction on how to interpret them. Most likely it was both of these. There were no circumstances under which Milner, Carson, Wilson, or indeed French, who was chief of the Imperial General Staff, would permit a move against Ulster. The most senior officers in the British Army actively intrigued with the men who controlled the UVF to prevent any attempt to enforce home rule was this not treason? Strangely, though, the Special Subcommittee and the War Office were involved with Paget over the two-day period. No records were kept. Such action was highly suspect, and for that reason, mystery has always surrounded the mutiny incident at the garage that was a consequence of the meeting at the War Office. On the 20th, Paget presented his subordinates in Ireland with an unprecedented opportunity to decide matters for themselves. Officers domiciled in Ulster were to be allowed to absent themselves from duty during any forthcoming operations. Puget's exact words were that these officers would be permitted to disappear until the Ulster crisis 
was resolved, then returned to their post as if nothing had happened. The effect was electrifying, but hardly surprising. Within hours of his return to Ireland, Piguet telegrammed the war office to say that officer commanding the 5th Lancer states all officers except two. Where was I? Within hours of his return to Ireland, Puget telegrammed the war office to say that officer commanding the 5th Lancer states, all officers except two, and one doubtful, are resigning their commissions today. I much fear the same condition in 16th Lancers. Fear men will refuse to move. Less than five hours later, Puget sent a second telegram. Regret, regret to report brigadier and 57 officers 3rd cavalry brigade prefer dismissal if ordered north defiance well precisely as Milner intended the wires in Ireland and Britain were hot with news about the mutiny at the Courage General Hige commander in chief at Aldershot and a member of Robert's Academy went to Downing Street to tell the Prime Minister that his own men strongly supported their fellow officers in Ireland. Wilson, French, Pugat, and Hajj, some of the most senior military figures of the day, sided against the government, but not one army officer was accused of treasonous action. Politicians lied about the circumstances. Denial swirled above Westminster like a breaking storm. It is a matter of record that Richard Haldane made a statement in the House of Lords that the government had no intentions of giving orders to the troops to intervene. These words were seen as a pledge that under no circumstances would the government use troops in Ulster. Haldane later illegally changed the Hansard proof copy by altering the sentence to read no immediate intention everyone involved bent the truth to the secret elite's advantage though bonar law denied it he kept open communication with officers at the garage an anonymous telegram was sent from there to the conservative leader at the commons at 5 40 p.m march 20 that simply told them General and all cavalry officers, Courage Division resigned today. Bonar Law knew it would happen, as did Balfour, Milner, Carson, Lord Roberts, General Wilson, and Sir John French. They had, after all, facilitated it. Discussions relating to the episodes were not recorded, but Seely made the unforgivable mistake of exposing the fact that the government condoned the conspiracy by signing a memo stating that the army would not be ordered to take up arms against Ulster. Sir John French made a similar mistake by initialing the document and thus exposed the collusion. When news of the mutiny broke and all hell was loose, was let loose in Parliament, Seely and French paid for their indiscretion and resigned. This conveniently deflected blame from the main conspirators. The secret elite's golden rule was never to put anything incriminating on paper, and if an instruction had to be written, ensure that it was burned afterwards. The Courage incident was carefully staged proof that the arm raised against Ulster could be paralyzed. As usual, Milner will prevailed. Wilner's mil will Milner's will prevailed. There are unparalleled fury in Parliament that, according to Winston Churchill, shook the state to its foundations. In an ugly Westminster puppet show controlled by the secret elite, their agents railed against one another and kept Ulster in the headlines. Between mid-March and the end of July of 1914, more than 700 parliamentary questions were raised over this action blocking serious debate and causing such a backlog that Asquith had eventually forced was eventually forced to refuse to accept any more. But all eyes stayed fixed on Ulster. And what of Churchill and Lloyd George, who had stirred alarm in provocative speeches at the height of the crisis? Churchill's declaration at Bradford 
that there are worse things than bloodshed was widely reported, and Lloyd George deliberately raised the hackles of Protestant Ulster in a tirade at Huddersfield on the 21st of March. Orange men professed to be shocked that force should be used for setting up a great free self-governing parliament in Ireland. But when did Ulster acquire detestation, detestation for, of coercion? Together, Churchill and Lord George created an atmosphere in which it was widely believed that the liberal government was on the point of bullying Ulster into accepting home rule. One half of the secret elite's political team was inciting bitterness and anger in Ulster, while the other half was declaring its complete support and loyalty. The Courage incident was brushed aside, accused as a misunderstanding, but the tensions in Ireland continued to rise towards boiling point. Throughout the weeks of outrage and posturing, a more dangerous conspiracy unfolded, a conspiracy that could never have been successful without the knowledge and permission of several governments across Europe. Events were so coincidental that it is possible to wonder if the one did not deliberately conceal the other. In a story more cliffhanging than any John Buchan adventure, the legend was that Major Fred Crawford, director of the ordinance of the UVF, procured 24,000 modern rifles and over 3 million rounds of ammunition under the nose of the German, Norwegian, Danish, and British authorities and landed them in a brilliant operation, the like of which Ulster had never seen. The narrative of the gun running episode was truly amazing. Crawford, another officer who had served and gained promotion under Lord Roberts' command in South Africa, spoke no German but found an armament supplier in Hamburg willing to sell him a vast quantity of rifles, bayonets, and bullets. He was commissioned to buy these on behalf of the UVF. Four days before the Courage incident, the UVF secured the services of a Norwegian collier, the SS Fanny. That accomplished Crawford met, that accomplished Crawford met with two members of the secret elite Walter Long and Bonar Law in London on the 27th of March and delivered a secret letter from Sir Edward Carson. Long had access to the funds raised by Milner and the secret elite and arranged for him to take ownership of a very large check. They shook his hands and wished him Godspeed and a successful issue. Crawford's evidence tied Bonar Law and Walter Long to the gun-running plot. The leader of His Majesty's opposition was directly involved in providing guns and ammunition for use against His Majesty's army in Ulster. Was that not treason? Had not others been summarily executed in past times for raising arms against the crown? Indeed. Yet, this was part of the grand conspiracy that they dared not call treason. This time it was called loyalty. Crawford needed cash to buy ships at short notice and deal with unforeseen contingencies, of which there were several. The secret elite provided. Once he had purchased the rifles in Germany, Crawford steered them through the Kiel Canal in a barge of Rendivius to in a barge to Rendivius with the to rendezvous, to rendezvous with the SS Fanny in the Baltic. Does anyone imagine that such a cargo could have passed unnoticed through the Kiel Canal in the March of 1914? During the transfer of weapons from the barge, Danish custom officers came on board and confiscated their papers, believing that their destination was Iceland, where coincidentally home rulers sought independence from Denmark. Yet they managed to slip away into the night, thanks, according to Crawford, to the intervention of Psalm 90. Reports of their arrest were printed in the daily paper, with the Times correctly stating that the destination of the guns was Belfast, not Iceland. The UVF assumed that the plot had been a disastrous failure. Not so. Miraculously, Psalm 90 prevailed and the Fanny negotiated the English Channel, 
avoided any intervention from the Royal Navy, and sailed around the Welsh coast to Tembe. Crawford was authorized to buy a second collier, the Clyde Valley, in Glasgow, to which the arms were transferred. After a further name change, the collier headed for Belfast Low as the Montjoy II. Throughout the night of the 24th and 25th of April 1914, the UVF unloaded 216 tons of weapons and ammunition at Larne, Bangor, and Donagadi. At Lard, at Larne, telephone lines were cut, roads blocked, and railway lines closed. The town was locked down, and just to make sure that the guns were landed safely, a decoy ship sailed into Belfast Low so that the customs and excess men had an excuse for their inaction at Larne, in Larne. The weapons were dispersed around Ulster under the command of the UVF assistant quartermaster general Wildrift Spender. Seen as a rising star in the British Army, Spender had been through the staff college at Camber- Camberley assisted Sir Henry Wilson at the War Office and served on the Committee of Imperial Defense. With no ties whatsoever to Ulster, he inextricably, he inexplicably gave up his glimmer, his glittering military career in 1913 to become a renegade with the UVF. Were it not an act of treason in itself, the landing of the UVF guns would have warranted a special award for exemplary planning. The police were physically blocked from the docks and custom officers boldly refused permission to examine the cargo. It was a tremendous coup for the Ulster volunteers. Carson in London received the coded one-word telegram, Lion, which signaled the Ulster was now armed, which signaled that the Ulster was now armed. Lord Roberts read about the success in special editions of the morning newspaper and rushed around to congratulate Carson in person. More pertinently, the whole process was completed under the knowing eyes of the authorities in Germany, Denmark, Dublin, and London. Reduced to a single headline, Germany had armed Ulster. Every action caused a reaction and the sight of an armed Ulster precipitated a military response from the south. A new, young generation of Irish nationalists regarded the Irish Parliamentary Party of John Redmond with ill-disguised contempt. Redmond was an Empire loyalist who seemed to have more in common with Sir Edward Carson than he did with the mass of Irishmen he presumed to represent. Sinn Féin, the Republican nationalist movement formed in 1905 to seek an end to British rule in Ireland, accused him and his party of being subservient to English party, political party considerations and actively detrimental to the best interests of Ireland. He maintained great faith in the British Empire and steadfastly refused to recognize its capacity for brutality. Happy to play the parliamentary game, constrained radicalism, and acknowledged the King Emperor Redmond dance to the secret elite's heir. In November of 1913, Totally disenchanted with Redman, a disparate group of nationalists set up the Irish Volunteer Movement of some 170,000 men, but significantly they lacked weapons, military experience, and united leadership. Two opposing forces are needed for a civil war, and in that aspect, the Irish Volunteers were useful to the secret elite but they had to move quickly to take control of the movement. In a late, desperate move, John Redmond forced its provisional committee to accept his nomination of 25 new members. Civil war could hardly break out if only one side had weapons, so the secret elite moved to arm the Nationalist Volunteers. Ponder, please, the main protagonist, the man who was chosen by them to provide guns for the South, Erks. Erkine er, Erkine Childers, author of The Riddle of the Sands and arch advocate of Britain's so called military unpreparedness, 
turned into a gun runner. The man whose 1903 book concluded that Germany was preeminently fitted to undertake an invasion of Great Britain and that Britain was ill-prepared to prevent it. It emerged in 1914 as an enemy of the state. How likely was that? The unqualified success of his spy thriller brought the Cambridge-educated childers into contact with the like-minded defenders of the Empire Lord Roberts. The novel provided Roberts and his National Service League with the valuable tool to excite fear and anti-German sentiment. Childers insisted his story was true, the names of the characters having merely been altered, and advocated that every man in Britain should be trained for service in either the Army or Navy. The book ran to three print runs in 1903, two in 1904 and 1905, and was reprinted again in 1907, 1908, 1910, and 1911. Winston Churchill praised the riddle of the sands, admitting that it influenced the Admiralty's decision to establish three completely new naval bases to deal with the so-called German naval threat. Erskine Childers was a champion of the British establishment. In his earlier book, In the Ranks of the CIB, about his active service in the Boer War with city imperial volunteers, Childers sang the praises of Lord Roberts and extols his bravery and his popularity among the rank-and-file soldiers. Later, in writing the preface of Childers' book, War and the Armed Blanche, Roberts reciprocated the compliment. No one has dealt so exhaustively and so logically with the aspect of cavalry and war as Mr. Childers. He has gone through thoroughly, he has gone thoroughly into the achievements of our cavalry in South Africa. In conclusion, I would ask you, my brother officers, in whatever part of the empire you are serving and whatever branch to read this book. It was a ringing It was a ringing endorsement of Britain's greatest living soldier. Childer's background was elitist and refined. He went to a private boarding school with Lionel Curtis and Basil Williams of Milner's famed kindergarten. Williams, a member of the secret elite, was his lifelong friend, as was Churchill's personal assistant and close friend Eddie Marsh. Childer's cousin and mentor, Hugh Childers, had in recent years been Home Secretary and Chancellor of the Exchequer in the Conservative government. Thomas Erskine, the Lord Chancellor, was his ancestor. Childers was held in such high esteem by the secret elite that he was invited to write Volume 3 of the Times' History of the South African War in conjunction with Basil William and Leo and Mary. He visited America in 1903 and wrote, There were no limits to the possibilities of an alliance of the English-speaking races. It was the vocabulary of the pilgrims. Childers was ex- Childers was steeped in the traditions of upper-middle-class England, loyalty to the king and defense of the empire. Although not named by Carol Quigley as a member of the secret elite, he was exceedingly close to many at its heart. For Childers, the growth, development, and expansion of the British Empire represented the best possible solution for all the economic and social problems facing the nation. Childers abhorred egalitarianism, and his philosophy was close to that of Milner and the Round Table. His friendships, background, philosophy, and writings marked him out as a man who was rightly regarded by the secret elite. Childers believed that Ireland's peace and prosperity was intrinsically linked to, and best assured by, remaining part of the United Kingdom. Yet according to his biographer, Andrew Boyle, this staunch British patriot became involved in gun running for Republican rebels because 
Suddenly, as if dazzled by a blinding vision, the views of Childers changed almost overnight. Astonishing. He disappeared to Ireland in the spring of 1911 to hold discussions with leading industrialists, government officials, unionists, and home rulers. Subsequently, Childers wrote a treatise in favor of a home rule structure in Ireland, more liberal, more understanding of the Catholic position, and openly critical of empire loyalists with whom he suddenly appeared to be completely at odds. Taken at face value, his framework of home rule demonstrated his conversion from an anti-German British empire loyalist to a rebel empire breaker, yet he retained his important associations with individuals close to the secret elite. It was as if he had rebranded his philosophy to appeal to a new audience. Crucially, it proved to be a passport into the trust of the Irish Irish volunteers. Early in May of 1914, Childers and a group of friends met at the plush Mayfair home of Alice Stomford Green, a house that had echoed with the the conversation of many of the most distinguished political and literary figures of the age, including Winston Churchill, James Bryce, and Lord Morley. Alice, the widow of an Oxford University history professor, was in close contact with influential men within the British establishment and the secret elite. Others at the meeting included Sir Sir Roger Caseman, Captain George Fitzharding, Berkeley, Lord Ashbourne, Sir Alexander Lawrence, Mary Spring Rice, and Connor O'Brien. Like Stopford Green and Childers, they all belonged to a privileged class. They conspired to raise 1,523 pounds, a not inconsiderable sum worth over 120,000 pounds today, to buy weapons for the Irish volunteers. While generous, it paled in comparison to the 100,000 pounds raised effortlessly by Milner and the UVF in the north. Born into a prosperous Irish Protestant family, Alice Stopford Green was the daughter of the rector of Kells and granddaughter of the Church of Ireland, Bishop of Meath. Professor Quigley identified her nephew, Robert J. Stopford, as a member of the secret elite. She was a close friend of Viscount Bryce, former British ambassador at Washington and a president of the Pilgrim Society. Dublin-born Sir Roger Caseman was at the time a distinguished British foreign officer diplomat, though his latter involvement, though his later involvement in Irish politics cost him his life. Lord Ashbourne came from a line of wealthy Protestants, Anglo-Irish landed gentry. Mary Spring Rice was the daughter of Lord Monteagle. Her great-grandfather had been Chancellor of the Exchequer and Secretary of State of War. She was the niece of Sir Cecil Spring Rice, the British Ambassador to the United States and a pilgrim. Connor O'Brien, cousin of Mary Spring Rice, was the son of Sir Edward O'Brien, a wealthy Irish Protestant landowner. Sir Alexander Lawrence was the son of Brigadier General Sir Henry Montgomery Lawrence. His late uncle had been Viceroy of India, Captain George Friss Harding Berkeley, the son of Major George Sackville Berkeley, attended the prestigious Wellington College, then Oxford University, where he was awarded a blue for cricket. This was not a typical terrorist cell. Childers and his and an accomplice, Darrell Figgis, son of an Irish-born tea merchant in Ceylon, went to Hamburg, where, despite a German ban on the export of weapons to Ireland, they purchased a quantity of virtually obsolete rifles. It was no coincidence that the arm deal was conducted through the same agent who supplied the Ulster volunteers months earlier. Several weeks later, in July of 1914, Childers and his wife, Molly, sailed their yacht, Asgard to pick up the armaments. Captain Gordon Shepard, a close friend, helped crew. 
educated at Eton and Sandhurst, Captain Shepard was an experienced sailor and a member of the prestigious Royal Cruising Club. Immediately after the gun running mission, he returned to his post with the Royal Flying Corps. By the time of his death in action in 1918, he was a mu- he was a much decorated brigadier general in the British Army and the highest ranking officer in the Flying Corps to die in action. Such profiles did not match known terrorists. A second yacht, the Kelpie, owned and crewed by Connor O'Brien, assisted Asgard with the gun running. They they rendezvoused with a German ship off the Belgian coast and transferred the weapons at sea. Asgard sailed back to Ireland through the assembled ranks of the British fleet at Portsmouth. A destroyer allegedly bore down on them at full speed, but they were not ordered to heave to. No one appeared to consider it suspicious that the yacht was stacked at every point with rifles and lay extremely low in the water. They endured dense fog and were hit by the worst storms seen in the Irish Sea for 30 years. Childers had to lash himself to the wheel to hold course, so the story goes, but like Churchill's adventures in South Africa, these gallant deeds lacked independent cooperation. To heroic acclaim from the nationalists, Childers landed his trench, his trench from the consignment of at Howe. Childers landed his trench of the consignment at Howe near Dublin on Sunday, 26 July 1914. At the same time, far to the east, the Russians began their secret mobilization against Germany. Only the Foreign Office and their secret elite minders knew of both events. Under the guise of an organized Sunday drill, the volunteers marched in broad daylight from Dublin to Howth to Howth to collect the weapons. Police and Coast Guards were warned off. It looked like a rerun of the UVF ex- the UVF experience at Larne until soldiers of the King's own Scottish borderers, having failed to apprehend the gun runners or seize their weapons, clashed with a jeering, taunting crowd of bachelors walk by the Liffey. Stones and insults were thrown and the troops fired into the crowd, killing three and injuring 38. Asquith was shocked by the news, not of the landing of the arms, but of the civilian deaths, which he realized would be deeply resented in Dublin. They were, they absolutely, they were. When the Kelpie returned to Irish waters with the tr- with her trench of weapons, Conor O'Brien was reluctant to land them directly at Kilcool because he and his yacht were well known to the authorities there. The weapons were transferred at sea to another yacht, Chota, which was owned by Sir Thomas Miles, president of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Miles became honorary surgeon to King George V and was awarded the prestigious Order of the Bath. Assisting him in the gun running was the Honorable James Creed Meredith, Meredith. Casey, the son of Sir James Creed Meredith, a wealthy Protestant Anglo-Irish landowner and deputy grand master and treasurer of the Grand Lodge of the Freemasons of Ireland. Trust us, please. It is beyond our capabilities to make this up. The roll call of honor for gun running. The roll call of honor for gun runners against the crown was completed when Colonel Fred Crawford of the UVF was awarded the CBE. The disparity between the gun running in Ulster with 24,000 modern rifles landed at Larne and the 1,500 aged weapons that made, that made it to Howth was very obvious. However, if carefully crafted, the subjective historian and the biased journalist, the corrupt politician and the prejudiced observer could say that both sides were armed for civil war. Reduced to a single headline, Germany had armed the Nationalist Volunteers. By July, the words civil war and inevitable hung around Britain like the proverbial albatross. 
King George V was certain of it because the cry of civil war is on the lips of the most responsible and sober-minded of my people. He was asked to call an all-party conference on home rule, but this intervention was to no purpose. There was no spirit of compromise, no last-minute reprieve. The time had not come yet. Edward Carson added to the drama of the moment, I see no hope of peace. I see nothing at present but darkness and shadows. We shall have once more to assert the manhood of our race. End quote. This was melodrama of the highest order, for there was no possibility of Ireland bursting into flames as long as Carson continued to keep Ulster in, in close check. The opposing Irish volunteers had neither the weapons nor the will to wage a debilitating war on Ulster. The British Army would not have permitted it. Civil war was an illusion conjured by politicians and newspaper loyal to the and newspapers loyal to the secret elite. They and they alone were in control. The hopelessness and tension that filled the spring and early summer of 1914 were genuine. The despair of the Ulster Protestants and the well-versed concerns voiced in Parliament were mostly sincere. Scaremongering was a strategic ploy, for in the realm of higher politics, the few connected to the secret elite knew precisely what they had done. Do not lose sight of the fact that these individuals had been planning war with Germany for over a decade. Looking back with the advantage of hindsight, something disturbing emerges from that, these episodes, something that jars, that jars. These folklore heroes of both the North and the South of Ireland who defied the crown, armed civilians, and gave credence to a coming civil war enjoyed most unusual careers thereafter. Immediately, war with Germany was declared. The Admiralty telegraphed the headquarters of the Irish Volunteers in Dublin directly and requested that Erkskeen Childers make urgent contact with them. The Admiralty Intelligence Department knew where to find Erkskeen Childers and they knew about the Asgard and the gun running. It was organized by and through them. How else could they could the yacht have passed through the midst of the greatest fleet ever assembled without being stopped and searched? Winston Churchill, prompted by his personal secretary Eddie Marsh, one of Childers' closest friends, had personally ordered his naval staff to contact Childers, the man who knew Germany's North Sea coastline in great detail. One can only wonder what the Irish volunteers would have thought had they seen Erkskind Childers shaking hands with Winston Churchill and saluting Admiral Lord Jellicoe on the 22nd of August 1914 before stepping into his own office in the Admiralty? What was it really about? What was it really about? We know that the secret elite and the Committee of Imperial Defense had long been prepared for war against Germany and that it was of the utmost importance that Germany appeared to take the first steps. What would have happened had General Moltec, Moltecki, General Moltecki decided to abandon the well-advertised siphoning plan and attacked France on a different frontier? Had Belgium's neutrality been honored? What could the secret elite have done? There had to be a plan B, an alternative scenario that would create such an outrage with, that war with Germany would follow. Consider the following. Germany had supplied both sides of the Irish divide with arms. The guns and ammunition had been sourced in Hamburg and were all traceable back there. Imagine the outcry if a cowardly explosion in a Belfast lodge or a Dublin pub had slain dozens of innocents in early August of 1914, or rogue gunmen had slaughtered unarmed civilians in the name of either cause. Blame would have quickly focused on the fall guy who had allowed the implicit weapon deals to go through, the Kaiser. Why was so little made of Germany's part in the gun running? Remember the Covenanter's motto. The Covenanter's motto. 
Put your trust in God and keep your powder dry. The secret elite were able to keep their powder dry because they did not have to revert to plan B. Summary, Chapter 25, Ireland, Plan B. The secret elite had long known that the Scheifling plan meant large numbers of German troops would pass through Belgium. This breach of Belgian neutrality would become the Causso Belli, the justification for war. If the Germans avoided Belgium, the secret elite required a fallback position. Irish became, Ireland became Plan B. Old age religious animosities were deliberately stirred in order to bring the Protestants majority in Ulster into a state of potential conflict with the predominantly Catholic South. Both sides were armed by the secret elite with weapons purchased in Germany. If required, civil war would have been declared and Germany blamed. At every stage, the secret elite were in control. The introduction of a home rule bill was used to generate unrest. Edward Carson was sent to Ulster to take charge. He created a large Protestant paramilitary wing, the Ulster's Volunteer Force, comprising some 100,000 men who had signed the covenant. It was a large and illegal private army that the British establishment actively supported. Alfred Milner assured Carson that he would not allow the British army to take up arms against the UVF. Army officers at the Courage were encouraged to refuse to move against the UVF. Senior figures in the army, the, end, the government, and the opposition front bench colluded to make this possible. Secret elite funds were used to procure weapons and ammunition in Germany. UVF officers brought them by sea to the northwest coast of Ireland and distributed them throughout Ulster. Officials in the police, coast guards, and British army were ordered to turn a blind eye. In the south, a large nationalist Catholic force formed spontaneously as a reaction to the arming of the UVF. Through John Redmond, the secret elite moved quickly to ensure their control over it. Erk Skeen Childer, an agent of the secret elite who had earlier infiltrated the nationalist movement and won their trust, proceeded to arm them. He, he and a group of upper-class Protestant friends with close links to the British establishment and secret elite funded the purchase of weapons and ammunition from Germany and delivered them to the South in their yachts. The scene was set for civil war should the secret elite need it to provide the cost of belly. In addition, the entire venture provided a convenient distraction and a smokescreen behind which preparations for war were rapidly progressed.